In this video, I'm going to show you about the force that a magnetic field makes on a beam of charged particles. The charged particles would be a beam of electrons inside this glass vacuum tube. The reason you need a vacuum tube is because uh, a beam of high velocity electrons in air would just stop very quickly when they hit air molecules. So this tube has had almost all the air pumped out of it. There's just a small amount of hydrogen gas in there which allows us to get enough of a glow so that we can actually see the beam when it's running. The beam's not turned on yet, because I'm going to show you how we get that going. Over at this end, those metal parts that you can see are an electron gun. Here it is a little closer up so you can see it better. Over here, there are some electrical connections. You can see some wires coming in there. That thing there that looks like a uh, Fever thermometer is a glass rod that's used for measuring things inside the tube. But the things to focus on are this metal plate and this other piece of metal up here, which is sort of shaped like a, shaped like a cup. I can turn it toward you so you can see it better. Now you can see the cup. And I think you can see that the cup has a little hole in the top. So that's a capacitor, meaning that we apply a, uh, a negative voltage to the bottom plate and a positive voltage to the top plate, and that creates an electric field in between. The goal was to create a beam of electrons, so we want to take electrons, extract them out of the bottom plate, accelerate them up to high speed using those electric fields as they get closer to the other plate, then the ones that fly through the hole are going to come out and make a pencil beam. And some of the details, like the specific shapes of the electrodes, are just to help with focusing the beam. The first step is to encourage some electrons to come out of that bottom plate. So to do that, we're going to heat it. There's a built-in heater in this thing. So I'll turn off the light, and then turn on the power supply for the heater. You can hear the fan running, and now you can see that nice, warm, friendly vacuum tube glow. Now I'll turn on the high voltage. There's going to be 300 volts between the top and bottom electrodes by the time I'm done. And you can see that green beam coming up. Now that you've seen the beam, I'm going to turn on a little bit of light so you can see what's going on around. The reason we can see the beam is just because a few of those electrons are so unlucky that as they're heading upward, before they get to the glass, they hit one of those rare hydrogen molecules in the very, very thin gas inside the tube. And that can result in the emission of some of this bluish light. So right now, except for those unlucky ones, uh, they're all going straight up following Newton's first law. No force acts on them, so they go in a straight line at constant speed. Now I'll bring in this magnet, and you'll see that the magnet makes a force on that beam. So if there had been no force, the beam would have kept going up straight. But because of the magnet's force, there's a force to the right, which deflects the beam to the right. I want you to pause for a second and think about this. Suppose I take my magnet now and flip it. Pause and think about what should happen if I then put the magnet back into the same position near the beam. OK, I'll go ahead and do that now. And you can see that the force from the beam is in the opposite direction now. I happen to have one of these old, giant CRT-style monitors. These are almost all gone these days because we have flat-screen LCD monitors. They are good still for one thing, though, which is demonstrating something about electricity and magnetism. So this huge glass tube is a vacuum tube, just like the one that I just showed you. The beam of electrons is shooting towards us and is painting the picture on the phosphor of the screen. Um, for me, on my monitor, this looks like there are uh, black bands sort of sweeping, sweeping down 
this thing in, in an annoying way like a strobe, that's because the frame rate of my webcam was not matched with the rate at which this thing paints its picture. And so now we can make magnetic forces on that electron beam, just like in the other uh, vacuum tube. So let's take a look at what happens when I do that. So I get all these weird colors. And I think you can also see that the picture is being distorted and moving around. Now let's do a little bit of more of a controlled experiment. So I'll get rid of, rid of my web browser. And now I'll just open up a black terminal window. I have a black background, but I think if I scoot my mouse cursor around in circles, you should be able to see the cursor. So there's the cursor, which is marking a certain point on the screen. And just to make it even easier to see what's going on, I'm also going to mark that point on the screen. So I'm going to use this piece of masking tape. Like that. So here's the mouse cursor, which I will position right above the corner of the masking tape. So now I'll go ahead and bring my magnet in from the right. And I think you can see that the image of the mouse cursor moved to the right, which means that the magnet is attracting the electron beam. Now, I want you to pause the video for a second and think about what will happen if I bring the magnet in from the left. OK, I'll warn you, everybody gets this prediction wrong. Here we come in from the left. And I think you'll see that now it's repelling it, even though the magnet's oriented the same way. So just so you can tell that I didn't cheat and flip the magnet in between, here's the magnet coming from the left, repelling the beam. And here it is, coming in from the right, attracting the beam. Attracting and repelling. Here's why everybody always gets that wrong. They're expecting this. So they're expecting the field pattern to be something like a source or a sink. So if that rectangle in the middle is the bar magnet, and we get an attraction, that would be like a force going toward the bar magnet. And then it would be true that if you came over to this side, you would still get an attraction. But that's not what we observed, right? And in fact, this is an impossible magnetic field pattern because the magnetic field doesn't have sources or sinks. We've already seen the magnetic field of a bar magnet before. We know it looks something more like this, like a fountain pattern. And in the orientation I had the magnet in, the fountain is actually fountaining out of the bottom and coming back in the top. So whatever uh, rule there is that says what kind of force we get, apparently the force is not in the direction of the field. Uh, but let's come back to that. The point is that it's just got to depend on the field. Well, the field is up right now. The field being experienced by the electrons here is an upward field. Well, what happens if I move this over here? Well, now again, the field being experienced by the beam is up. So whatever other complicated things could be going on, if you, if you subject the electrons to the same field, they're going to experience the same force. And what we can see from this demonstration is that the force is actually perpendicular to the field. So in our example, the velocity vector of the electrons is coming out of the screen toward you. The magnetic field is up at right angles to that. But the force is perpendicular to both of those things. The force is that way. So it's like an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis all perpendicular to each other, and there's a right-hand rule going on here. The equation here is called the Lorentz force law. So if we've got a charge Q moving with a velocity vector B through a magnetic field B, then you can take the vector cross product, multiply it by the charge, and that gives you the force acting on that charge. So if I use colored pens for those three vectors, Let's say the purple pen 
is the velocity vector which is coming out of the screen toward you. And let's use red for the magnetic field. So the, perp the red pen is pointing up. And it is important that you put these all tail to tail. Then there's a right hand rule which is V cross B is going to be in this direction. V cross B gives you a vector cross product to the left. So my thumb was pointing to the left. That's the direction of V cross B. But remember, these are electrons, so Q is negative. Therefore, we multiply by a negative number, and that flips the result. So the force vector is to the right, because Q is negative. It may seem really weird that the force is not even on the same line as the magnetic field. Why would this rule be so strange? Actually, it makes a lot of sense, and it's not even really that different from the way electric forces work if you think about it in the right way. So for electric forces, we have a rule that electric field lines give us tension along the electric field lines, and then pressure in the direction perpendicular to those field lines. So you can see that that makes sense here in this example of the uh, capacitor. The tension parallel to the field lines makes the positively and negatively charged plates attract each other and want it want to collapse together. At the same time, there's the pressure in the horizontal direction, perpendicular to the field lines. And that makes sense because the positive charges are repelling each other. And also, the, the negative, negatively charged plate wants to explode because the negative charges are repelling each other. So then, if we apply exactly those same rules to a moving charged particle in a magnetic field, we get the right result. So here in this diagram, I've got a background field, which is a uniform magnetic field pointing to the left. But superimposed on top of that, I have the field made by a positive charge going into the screen, away from your face. The magnetic field of the positive charge forms circular loops going clockwise around it. When you superimpose the two fields, they partially cancel up on top of the charge. That's why we have a weaker field up there. Uh, the field lines are spaced farther apart. Then down below the charge, the, the two fields are both to the left, so they reinforce. And we get a stronger field, which you can see because the field lines are closer together, indicating a more intense field. So. Uh, if we use the rule that there's tension parallel to the fields, well, that's going to cancel out because that's symmetric left and right. But there's also pressure perpendicular to the field lines. That means that the pressure up on top, which is weaker, is not going to be enough to cancel out the pressure on the bottom, which is stronger. Therefore, we're going to have an overall force upward on this particle, which is exactly what the right-hand rule tells us. I want you to think about this now. Suppose that the velocity vector is straight out of the screen. And then suppose that we make it so that the magnetic field is also straight out of the screen. So the v vector and the b vector are parallel. And they're both pointing toward u. And then we have a problem, because if the rule is that the vector cross product is supposed to be perpendicular to both the red vector and the purple vector, there are many, many different directions that that could be and still be perpendicular to both of those vectors because this is the special case where these are parallel. They lie along the same line. So stop for a minute and think about what you think would happen in that situation where the v vector and the b vector are in the same direction. Pause the video, and then I'll actually do it. So if I actually want to act out that experiment, it's awkward to do with the computer screen because there the electron beam was coming out of the screen at you. I would have to put the magnet in front, and then it would block your view. So that's why I'm going to do it now with the original vacuum tube. Then I can line things up so you can see. So here's the magnet. And if you think about the fountain pattern, the magnetic field would be along a vertical line, either up or down. I haven't checked what the polarity of the magnet is right now. So that's a vertical magnetic field and a vertical velocity vector for the beam. And then if I bring the magnet in, you can see it's having almost no effect on the beam. So that's the answer to that 
paradox about that right hand rule. The right hand rule doesn't define any direction for that force because that force is zero in that situation where the field is in the same direction or along the same line as the velocity vector. And it actually doesn't matter whether it's parallel or anti-parallel. So I can go like this and get no, no force. I can also go the other way and still get no force. Whereas this magnet is plenty strong enough to do strong things to the beam if I don't put the forces parallel to each other. Excuse me, don't put the vectors parallel to each other. I'm sure you noticed before these circular coils of copper wire, one in front, one in the back. This is called magnet wire because we can wind it in coils like this without creating a short where the wires touch each other. There's some kind of thin enamel or uh, plastic uh, insulation surrounding the wires and keeping them from being in electrical contact with their neighbors in that bundle. So the purpose of these coils, which we haven't used yet, is to create uh, a magnetic field in the region where the electrons are. And it's sort of like a solenoid, which you've seen before. Uh, so a solenoid would be a cylinder. And the difference here is just that we leave a gap between the two coils. That gives us access to the inside and makes it easier to see what's, what's going on. So this arrangement is called a Helmholtz coil. And it gives us a relatively uniform field on the inside of the coils. Um, and that field is going to be along the axis, meaning like along this in and out line. So now I'm going to hook up a power supply to these two electrical connections down here for the Helmholtz coil. And those connections run up through these wires and into the coils. I've got the power supply turned all the way down now so you won't see anything happen yet. And now, once I turn on the field, the mag mag magnetic field actually is going to point outward for the polarity that I have hooked up. So I'd like you to stop and think about this. If the magnetic field is coming out of the screen and the velocity vector of the beam is the purple pen, which is pointing up, I want you to predict which way the force will be on the electrons. And remember that they're negatively charged, so that flips the result. So now before I do that, please pause the video, think it through, and make a prediction. OK, let's go ahead and do that. So the right-hand rule tells me that V cross B will be to the right. However, these are negatively charged particles, so that flips the sign on QV cross B. And we predict that the force will be to the left. Let's see if I got that right. I'll turn up the knob on the power supply. And I think you can see that the beam is being deflected to the left. Now let's see what happens when I turn up the magnetic field even higher. The beam is bending more and more strongly. And if I keep on going, I get a circular loop. So let's think about the geometry of that. If you think back to your first semester mechanics course, you know that in order to have circular motion, you always need a force toward the center of the circle. So for instance, at the right side of the beam, if there weren't a force toward the center, it would go off straight. So we need a force to the left to deflect it. At the top of the beam, if there were no force at that point, the beam would continue on straight to the left. But because we have a force to deflect it, it curves that way. And that force needs to be down, again, toward the center. So the way I can do this is by holding my model with my pens like this. So the red pen is the magnetic field vector. The purple pen is the velocity vector. And the green pen is the force, which is like minus V cross B, because Q is negative. So here they are oriented for the right-hand side of the circle. We get a force toward the center. If I now want to do the top, all I have to do is take my hand 
and rotate my model rigidly. Now, B, the red pen, is still out of the screen. V, the purple pen, is still to the left. And my F vector points downward, which is now toward the center of the circle, just the way it needs to be. So as I keep on going around the circle, the force always adjusts itself to be in exactly the correct direction to produce a force toward the center. And that's why we get circular motion here. One last fun thing here. I've got the vacuum tube held in here with these two yokes here and here. And I loosened up the yokes so I can now rotate the vacuum tube. So I've got the magnetic field turned off. The beam is going straight up. If I now rotate the beam, rotate the tube this way, you can see that the beam is coming out in whatever direction I rotate it to. So now the fun thing to think about is, what if I turn the magnetic field on? You probably saw it there because I didn't even have it lined back up the, the normal way. So here it's a circle, but now if I tilt the beam, I get a helix. Here I am rotating it back toward the position that gives me a circle again. Thanks for watching. I hope this video has been helpful as far as helping you understand the right hand rule for positive charges or if you need to use the left hand for negative charges, you can do that too.